Hello and welcome to this program today. We're excited to have Susan Campbell, a naturalist, here talking with us about flying jewels and wildflowers in the garden, the science of banding hum hummingbirds, part of the North Carolina Botanical Gardens Year of the Wild Wildflower program and exhibition. We want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we are recording this presentation. And because of the size of the audience today and use of Zoom webinar, you'll notice that your video and audio are, are muted. I am Joanna Lalikas. I oversee the education program at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And Lauren Green is here with me. She'll be providing some uh, support and moderation, co-moderation today. She's providing interim public program support to the garden and she's our youth environmental education specialist as well. She'll quickly give you uh, an overview of the Zoom webinar platform that we're using today. And she'll also be assisting us with the Q&A throughout and at the end. So Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, so by now we're mostly Zoom experts, I feel like. Um, but just a quick overview. If you move your mouse down to the bottom of your screen, your Zoom dashboard should appear. That'll give you access to your audio settings. At the bottom, you'll see that you're muted by default. There's a carrot that you can click on to get to your audio settings for options for sound and output. We also have the Q&A. We'll be using that feature today for you to be able to type questions in for the speaker. So if you have any questions as we go along for the speaker at any point, go ahead and type them into the Q&A. We'll pause periodically to discuss those questions. We also have the chat feature. The chat feature is great. If you have any technical issues, please type them in the chat feature and we will help you. We'll also have some poll questions today that we'll be asking you and you can respond to those using the chat as well. If the Q&A and chat are not accessible to you, please use the raise your hand feature. And when we pause, we will call on you to be able to unmute your mic and help you out that way. So again, we've got our audio settings, our chat, our raise our hand, and our Q&A. And I'm going to turn it back over to Joanna. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, for folks coming in late later here, if you have any issues with Zoom, type your concerns in the chat and Lauren or I will try and help you out. Uh, we'd love to get to know a little bit about who's on the webinar with us today and get you used to using the polling function. So Lauren is going to ask the first question in the polls here. So where are you joining us from? Are you in the Triangle area? Are you in North Carolina somewhere else? Are you outside of North Carolina, but in the US? Are you outside of the US? And I'll ask if uh, you're not in the Triangle region, if you want to type in the chat where you're from, we would love to know where else folks are joining us from. Ah, we have someone from Baltimore, Maryland. Welcome, that's terrific. Most folks are with us in the Triangle, 88%. We have four folks with us from outside of North Carolina and someone in North Carolina, not in the Triangle. So welcome, everybody. I see someone else is from Tucson, Arizona. Welcome. So glad to have you with us today. All right. So this program uh, was developed in partnership with the New Hope Audubon Society. And I really want to thank Barbara Driscoll, who's with us today, for working with us to, um, to bring Susan here and to thank the society for working with us to bring Susan here today. So just a quick reminder, if you have questions during the program, remember to ask the questions of the presenter via the Q&A function. Uh, also, uh, you can send us technical questions, technical issues through the chat, and we'll work to help you resolve those. And we'll have several breaks throughout the presentation today where we'll, uh, Susan will ask you some questions through polls and we'll have an opportunity for Q&A and Lauren's gonna help moderate those Q&A questions. So 
Barbara Driscoll is with us from the New Hope Audubon Society, and I'm going to hand it over to her to introduce today's speaker. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I'm president. Hi, I'm Barbara Driscoll. I'm president of New Hope Audubon, which is the local Audubon chapter for Orange, Durham, and Chatham counties. And you can find information on our upcoming events and programming at newhopeaudubon.org. We are happy to continue our long partnership with the North Carolina Botanical Gardens by bringing Susan Campbell to you today. Susan Campbell is a licensed hummingbird bander and lead hummingbird researcher in North Carolina. She has been working with hummingbirds for over 15 years as research affiliate with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Having banded over 4,000 hummingbirds around the state, and I find that an incredible number of hummingbirds to have banded, um, Susan has the insight into the distribution, movements, and ecology of North Carolina's smallest bird species. In addition to her, her research, Susan is a seasonal naturalist with the North Carolina State Parks and is an educator as well as a writer who has regular columns in a variety of publications. She has been involved with other large annual hummingbird events around the state, such as Wild Wings at the Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Belmont and the Hummingbird Festival in Charlotte. You may have seen Susan working with her tiny subjects as part of the first episode of Exploring North Carolina on PBS. And with that, I turn it over to Susan. And thank you for doing this, Susan. Thank you. It's great to be here today. Um, I think we're going to have a good time talking about hummingbirds. This is a great time of year to be talking about hummingbirds because they're still very numerous across the state of North Carolina, across the east, eastern U.S., um, and they are on the move. So things are changing. As much as we're seeing them in our yards, they are moving in and out on a daily basis. Um, and so it gives us some variety in terms of what we're seeing. Um, and fortunate enough today to actually be able to look at two different ruby throated that we have just caught here in the yard. Um, kind of want to start with that. And as I'm working with these birds, we'll be talking about aspects of hummingbird identification and that sort of thing. Um, just to dive right in. First of all, ruby-throated hummingbirds are the only breeding species of hummingbird that we expect in North Carolina. Actually, it's the only breeding species we expect east of the Mississippi River. But they are found from northern Florida all the way up into Canada during the summer months. That being here in North Carolina from April through, a lot of times now, through October. So we still have some time yet to go with these little guys and gals. So uh, the fun is, is far from over. But our peak in terms of population numbers, we typically think of as being late July or early August. So if you're noticing some decline in your yard, uh, it is unfortunately that as these birds are moving through and they're moving out. Uh, the ruby-throated is the smallest bird in North Carolina. And I've got a little guy here who I've just given it away, is a little guy. You can see one tiny little feather right there. That means he's a he. Um, the other thing about ruby throats is that the males are smaller than the females. So when I measure him, he is going to be significantly smaller in terms of his wing, uh, his bill. But um, he's going to have to do a complete quick change before he makes it back up here next spring because he's got to look like his daddy by then. He's got to fill in that red throat. Uh, he's got to swap out the, the tail, which you see here has little white tips on it. That tail's got to be jet black and forked when he gets back here in order to, to impress the ladies. Hummingbirds, because of the fact that they don't sing like songbirds, use body language. And for that, especially the males, with all the impressing they have to do of the, of the females and all of the competition they do with other males, have to have a really good rudder. They have to have the long tail. And being slightly smaller does give them an edge. It means that they're more maneuverable as they're flying around doing what it is that they do. Um, so he's going to have to look completely different by next, by next spring. But for now, he's that beautiful green, and his tail's got some little white tips on it. Okay. And when these birds leave the nest, by the way, they are fully grown. So all of him is, would have been just like this when he left the nest. 
takes hummingbirds a good three weeks to develop in the nest before they fly. Um, there are two young hummingbirds in a nest and they come from two tiny white eggs that are incubated by the female for a good two weeks. Yeah, she feeds them from, for at least three weeks. And by the time they leave the nest, they are fully capable of independent living. They're fully grown, fully feathered, and ready to go. Uh, and here in North Carolina, our females have time during the summer months to have two sets of two young in the summertime. Um, for our hummingbirds, the summer is pretty much over. There may be a few nests of older nestlings out there uh, that are getting ready to leave, but from the bulk of our adults, the breeding activity is over. Actually, for the males, the breeding activity was over just after 4th of July. The adult males are the first ones to return in early April. They're the first ones to leave in July. So our adult males have actually been on the move for about a month already, believe it or not. The adult males you're seeing now almost certainly are from further north. And by Labor Day, you'll be hard pressed to see an adult male. After Labor Day, most of the hummingbirds we have around in our gardens and our yards uh, that we see out in the woods are going to be birds from further north, almost certainly. And these birds are making their way to Mexico and Central America. We're not sure exactly where they go a lot of the time, but they're heading south to spend the winter months down there. And uh, so it's gonna take them a while to get, to get down there. Given that they're only flying about 60 to 80 miles a day, maybe, depending on the weather, and they're flying about treetop level, powered flight, um, it's gonna take them a while to get where they're going. Now, this little hummingbird I've had um, here in my hand for a little bit. So I already put, if you can see this, a band, put the band on his leg. Let me turn him around. So you can see there's a little bit of silver there. See that silver? That's the little marker that we put on this little guy. That marker has five numbers and a letter. The letter is shorthand for four more numbers because all bird bands have to have nine characters. With hummingbirds, we can't fit that many characters on the band, so we just have a, a letter that denotes the other four characters. So it's a tiny bracelet that can move with him, like my bracelet here, can move with him, but it's not gonna come down over his foot. It's unique to him, like giving him a name, like a social security number, no other bird's gonna have this combination. So if we encounter him again, we'll know exactly who he is. Um, so yes, this is a very handsome, little young of the year, male ruby throat. Um, his throat is a little atypical in that it's not very dark and streaky. A lot of these young males have a lot of five o'clock shadow is what I call it. Um, with him, his streaks are pretty light, but we do see that one red feather. And that's the thing that tells us definitively, okay, this is a little male. That and the fact that he is, he is definitely smaller in size. Okay. I'm gonna put him over on the side here. Um, I've given him a snack. These birds, when they're hungry, they will eat from my hand. And um, he's been eating since hmm, 6.30 this morning, since it got late, light this morning. And uh, so he's probably pretty, pretty well fed. Um, since this is, this is a youngster, he, he very likely is a migrant. Um, we typically think of the migrants leaving in the morning and spending the day flying and then coming down in the late afternoon. But some of these youngsters take their time. And I think with this little guy, he probably has been, been taking his time today. Um, so is spending, may spend a day or so here in the yard. Um, what's interesting when we ban these hummingbirds here in the yard or anywhere that I ban ruby throats at this time of year, we do give them a little color of paint, a little dot of paint on the head, a white dot on ruby throats. And, um, that's one of the ways we can tell that they move on pretty fast because we don't see hummingbirds with, with dots from day to day. We may for you know, a matter of hours after, after I ban these birds, they're not really frightened by what we're doing. They come back to the feeders. Um, early in the summer, I'll have ruby throateds that I catch multiple times in one day, certainly multiple times during the week when I'm banding down at the state park where I regularly band. Um, so they're not really phased by this method that we're using to catch them. The trapping method that I like best is what we're using today. It's a wire cage trap with a feeder inside, using that feeder as, as bait. And the birds will come in to feed at the feeder and we will just release the string that we're holding in our hand, which will drop the, the trap door down. 
and then it's a matter of, of reaching in one of the small doors on the side to take a bird out and uh, very quick very smooth what they tend to do is they they will fly up fly around the top of the trap so it's it's fairly easy to, to corner them at the top of the trap birds instinctively fly up to get away and so when they fly up and then they're in the the, the, the top of the trap they're pretty easy to, to take hold of and then uh, and then we bring them in we put them in a, a little holding bag like this one and we will be able to to work with them when we're when we're set and we're ready to go um, I'm just going to show you because these bands are hard to see they're about a th thousandth of a, a gram in, in weight um, and if I hold up this diaper pin you're going to see this is a hummingbird band up here these are songbird bands down here that are engraved, okay? The hummingbird band is laser printed with that number letter combination that I told you about. And yes, this is a diaper pin. That's about the, the best, the closest diameter to a uh, hummingbird leg that we have. So I like to store them on these pins. Um, it's a pressed aluminum bat band that I have to actually make myself uh, the bands come as strips of 10. Here's a strip of 10. And I will cut that down with some special tools and make it into the band that I then will form such that I can put it on the hummingbird's leg. I use a special pair of pliers here with holes that are drilled exactly the size for these bands in order to just crimp it around the bird's ankle. Um, so it's, it's all similar to other types of bird banding. It's just at a smaller scale. Um, and it's one of these things where I certainly hope that uh, my dexterity doesn't, doesn't become an issue over time. I don't have to worry so much about being able to see. I can magnify, and I certainly need to these days, magnify to see what I'm doing. But if I can't, can't work carefully with these small birds, then it's, it's gonna be a bit of a problem. So right now I am reaching into this bag. I don't know who I'm going to pull out, kind of like Christmas. And lo and behold, when I pull the bird out, this is yet another young male. This time we can see, see those spa sparkly, several red feathers in the throat. Looks like this fella's got about four or five so far. And he's definitely got that good five o'clock shadow that I was telling you about. Um, so the males, Young males, they, they are um, more numerous than the young females. It turns out that we know the sex of ruby-throateds in the nest skewed towards the young males. The adult hummingbird world skewed towards females. Uh, and for ruby-throateds, this isn't what we think of as a problem because with hummingbirds, there's no pair bonding. The females are the ones that do all of the work during the summer. Males are out there to look handsome and they basically um, are out there to attract females who, who come by to, uh, to visit with them, be impressed by them. Um, so there are far fewer males than there are females in the, popul in the adult population. Um, so in the summer I always figure I'm going to be handling more young males and this summer's been no exception um, to that. The number of red feathers in their throat doesn't really denote age at this point in time. Um, some leave the nest with a few red feathers. What's more um, indicative of their, their age are going to be the degree to which they have grooving on their bill. Their bill as it grows stretches and there are stretch marks that will extend all the way down to the tip of the bill, um, but wear smooth in the first few months of life. So if I can look at his bill and get a sense of how how much grooving there is, I can get a sense, did he leave the nest in June? Did he leave the nest in July? Maybe he didn't leave the nest until early in August, which is certainly possible, uh, especially if you see a North Carolina bird. Susan, we've got a question about what triggers the production of the red feathers in the males. Is it hormones? It is hormones, yes. It is definitely hormone levels. Um, and some of these birds, when they're passing through in the fall, uh, already have a good number of red feathers. In fact, in late fall, I have seen more than one young male that has had almost a complete gorget. And it's tricked me until I've, I've looked at the tail and seen the, the white tips on the tail that give away 
you know, that that's, that's a youngster. Um, I've thought, oh my goodness, you know, I've gotten an, an adult male in late summer, but no nope, youngster that's just got, for whatever reason, more hormones flowing already and is developing those uh, red feathers. So all I, I do with these birds, when I am putting the band on, see if I can show you this, I just basically hold on to the foot. Just gonna hold on to the foot. And I'm going to put the band around the ankle with my special pliers. And there's the band right there. Pretty simple. I'll just turn it to make sure it's completely closed um, so that it's not going to catch on anything. Hummingbirds live three to five years on average and so it gives us you know some time to be able to re-encounter these birds. Certainly longevity is one of the things that we've learned about from banding. Uh, remarkably we've had some females in the last couple of years that have been found, banded females, that have been recaptured over nine years old. Pretty amazing for a bird that is not much bigger than a bug. Um, it's it's just amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, the females, being that they're bigger bodied, we would expect to be able to live a little bit longer. But boy, that's that's a lot of work for a female hummingbird. Nine years of of basically, um, you know, breeding all summer, taking this long migration uh, down to the winter wintering grounds. Um, time after time after time. And the thing is, we know also from banding that when they migrate, ruby-throateds don't use the same route. They go one way in the fall and a different way in the spring. And we know this again from banding. Banded birds that were banded in the spring are never seen again in the fall during migration. This comes from colleagues of mine further south. Um, they only see individuals that they have worked with and they put the bands on during the same season. Um, makes sense. We know this happens with other species of birds um, that take different routes, everything from peregrine falcons to um, some of our other small songbirds, blackpole warblers. Um, so it's, it's not a huge surprise. But the thing that is amazing about hummingbirds, one of the things, is that they don't learn their migratory route. It is hereditary. It is passed down. It is innate. It's up here. The map is already up here. So they migrate when their bodies tell them it's time to go, and that's based on day length changes that trigger hormone levels. And they go and they follow a route that their ancestors have, have followed. And we think that where they end up in the tropics, they're down there probably mingling with family members the same way they do up here on the breeding grounds. Um, and it's, it's really remarkable that they can do this. Their brains are the largest brain of any bird for their size because we think they need just to remember so much information. They do learn along the way, but everything that they need to know to survive is already pretty much up here. It is incredible that this, this tiny bird has got all that and is ready to go and knows exactly what to do, doesn't even have to think about it really. Um, they are really very, very special. They are the only birds that can fly not only sideways and backwards, but upside down. Um, and of course, they're the only birds that can truly hover. And that's by virtue of how their wings are attached. Very different sort of attachment arrangement of musculature that allows their wings to essentially rotate in the socket to create that updraft that they need in order to, to actually hover. Um, their average flight speed is about 35 miles an hour, but the males have been clocked at over 90 during display dives when they're using gravity. Um, really, really pretty amazing. Um, they've got, meta their metabolism is very high, as you might imagine. Their heart is beating about 60 times a second. Um, breathing rate is about that fast. So they really do live life in the fast lane. And one of the ways that this is possible is the fact that they go into a nighttime hibernation in order to conserve energy. And that we call torpor. And that is one of the things that makes this lifestyle possible. Other birds don't really do that. Hummingbirds do that a lot. So Susan, we've got some other questions coming in. One is I think what you just said is somebody asked if they fly at night. No, nope, they don't. They are very visual creatures. So they need to be able to see 
Um, so they don't migrate or feed or anything once it gets dark. As it's getting dark, they will go into a rest state. They will go into a thick protected spot and they will basically go to roost there in some thick leaves or in a protected area, even around your house, it could be happening. You just don't know it, but they will go and they will basically find a protected spot and, and they will puff up. Generally, they tilt their beak up so that they don't look very bird-like and they will rest until it gets light the next day. And as it gets light, then they will come to you and they'll be very interested in feeding. And that's why uh, early in the morning, they're very aggressive about feeding as soon as it's light. Um, and they also do feed quite a bit in the late afternoon before, before dark uh, in order to tank up for, for the night. Um, but they, they don't move around at all in the dark. They are not really capable of, of that, so no. Um, and we've got another question. Uh, Stephen has more than 10 hummers that are eating about a liter of sugar water each day from three feeders. Do you yeah. think that they're mostly residents or are now migrants at this point? It's a mix, more migrants than, than residents at this point. Um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty good number of hummingbirds. And what's interesting is he probably has more hummingbirds than he realizes. When we look out and we count the number of hummingbirds we can see at one time, that's only a fraction of the birds that are out there. There are, there's a lot of turnover at food sources for hummingbirds. Um, it, it can be that for every one that you see, there are six or seven others that are probably coming through. Hummingbirds do what we call trap lining. They will take advantage of resources in an area and they'll move from spot to spot to spot. And so it's not just the same hummingbirds in your yard every day. Um, there is a lot of turnover, even when it's not migration time. So if he's got that many, he's probably feeding even more, which would explain how much sugar water he's going through. That's, that's really pretty cool to have that many birds. That's, that's, that's quite something. Um, interesting thing about hummingbirds that people don't realize, and this is very important, is that they don't feed on sugar water completely or flowers obviously flowers or sugar water completely they need a lot of protein to fuel to fuel that engine um, they are really very good at insect hunting am i is my powerpoint coming up Yes, it is. Okay, so let me just let me just show you here. Um, Going to back up, kind of giving things away. Um, yes, they do use flowers. A lot of native flowers, which is sort of why, why one of the reasons we're talking about hummingbirds here, because they utilize a lot of native flowers. They're probably that's the best thing you can use to attract hummingbirds as native plants better than feeders. They don't require any of the upkeep that feeders do, and they're going to be getting nutrients from the flowers in your yard. Um, so if anything, I would say, you know, planting for them is much better than having a feeder. Feeders require care. We know that if you don't take care of your hummingbird feeders, that mold and other toxins will grow in the sugar water that can make the birds sick. Um, so unless you're able to Clean your feeders right now, every three days is really what you need to do before it starts to spoil. If you can't do that, it's best to plant for them. And there's so many choices here in North Carolina of wonderful native plants. This happens to be a Sandhills lily from down in uh, Richmond County, Richmond County, Moore County, the Sandhills area. These are found in very small populations. It is a very neat, but not very common plant. But it is definitely ones that the hummingbirds down there in the sand hills will find and will nectar on. Um, and I was thrilled to pieces to, to get that photo from a friend of mine. Um, here's a, a mom hummingbird with her, her chicks. Uh, like I said, there are two of them. And you can see they're growing like crazy. Um, the hummingbird nest that they are in, you can also see is stretching. This nest that hummingbirds build is made with spider webbing, which allows the nest to grow as the young grow, so that uh, they don't out, quite outgrow it. Although by the time those babies are probably, in this case, another five, six days old, they're gonna barely fit in that nest when it's time to leave. Um, but it's also camouflage on the outside. 
For hummingbirds, camouflage is the name of the game to keep away from predators, whether it's the adults or the youngsters. Uh, because they're so small, uh, they really need to utilize cam camouflage and they do a great job of it. Um, but that, that nest is a real thing of engineering and of beauty as well. Um, I have never found one myself because they're so small and well camouflaged, it is hard to find a hummingbird nest. I don't know how many of you all out there have ever been fortunate enough to find one, um, but I have yet to find one. I've seen a few in the wild, but I have yet to fi actually find one. Yes, these little birds need to feed on insects, lots of insects. And we don't often see them doing that or understand that that is what they're doing. This, this guy here, and it is a young male, and you can see that five o'clock shadow in his throat. Um, that little male has spotted that bug and is about to take off and grab it with his bill. Um, they also spend a lot of time flying around in vegetation, looking for insects in nooks and crannies and in the leaves of vegetation. And that's one of the reasons that we find hummingbirds so, so abundantly in wetter areas because it's more buggy there. And so there's more real food for them in, in a wetter environment that has more of these tiny bugs. What insects do they eat? Well, basically anything that fits down the hatch, whether it's flies, mites, spiders, um, anything tiny. Yes, they probably eat a few mosquitoes, um, but they're really going to be feeding on whatever happens to you, be abundant and something that they can, they can swallow. So it's a wide variety of, of invertebrates that they will take, but they need lots and lots of protein. And the females feed their young almost exclusively insects because those youngsters need lots of protein as they're growing. Now sugar water and flower nectar will help them gain weight quickly for migration. By the time these birds get as far south as the Gulf, they have to be almost twice their normal body size, body weight, in order to have the insurance to make it where they're going. And for a hummingbird, that means that a male who generally is a little less than three grams, he has to be about six grams by the time he gets down there. And for the females, for them, it's gonna be closer to seven grams because they're typically about three and a quarter, three and, three and a third uh, grams, uh, normal, normal svelte body weight. So, Having carbohydrate definitely helps them bulk up quickly, but they still need loads of insects even when they're migrating. Um, so that is, that is something that's even more important than providing them with the flowers and the sugar water, which sugar water and feeders are a great entertainment for us. But for the birds, it's only really a pick-me-up. Um, it's the insects that they really truly need in order to, to survive and, and to thrive. Um, this time of year, not only am I banding these migrant ruby throats, um, but I'm also waiting with bated breath to hear about white hummingbirds. Yes, hummingbirds do sometimes have odd plumages and ruby throats are no exception. This year we've had four reports already here in the state of folks that have spotted unusual white or white-ish hummingbirds at their feeders. Um, the individual you see depicted here was one that I heard about, I believe, last week, and it was at a home in Carborough. And this little guy, again, it's a little guy, you can see that five o'clock shadow in his throat. Uh, this little guy is a partial albino. He's got some completely white feathers, and the rest of him is, is pretty normal looking, but it's certainly eye-catching. And when he spread his wings, wow, that's, that is very unusual, pretty cool to see. Um, Partial albinism, or what we call leucism, when the bird is white-ish, maybe gray or buffy-ish, um, is not as rare as a full albino. Um, full albinos, I don't hear about them too often. It's every several years at most that I'll hear about one or see pictures or get to see in person uh, a full albino. I've only banded, I think, three full albinos in the years that I've been doing this, but I have been able to get to a number of these white birds. The problem is, like the case of this individual here, they're migrants typically, and I'll hear about them, I'll get a call or an email, and if I'm set up to even go the next day, lo and behold, they're gone. So um, I have heard about and gotten photos and details of far more um, of these white hummingbirds than I've actually been able to see, unfortunately. Um, this bird here is one uh, from Chapel Hill, again, was on site one day 
and you can see it is very white. Uh, this is what we call a uh, leucistic individual. It is very pale all over, um, but the bill, if you could see it, the bill is dark and it's got a little bit of dark uh, feathering in the tail. So not complete albino, but uh, definitely white. Very, very interesting looking individual. We have any more questions at the moment? Yes, we've got lots of questions, Susan. Um, and I am going to start with the most recent one because it's about our albinos here. Uh, it says, will a partial or full albino male be able to breed or do the females shirk them because of their appearance? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, quite frankly, these white hummingbirds, we don't believe survive very long. Um, so they don't even have the chance to breed in the springtime. We have never seen one returning in the, in the spring, not even a partial albino. And the reason for that, we think, is, is not that they are more noticeable, which they are, and so maybe it's more susceptible to predation, but that white feathers are very brittle. And unfortunately, brittle feathers don't, aren't, aren't, a, good, aren't a good feature on a bird that is this active, that spends this much time flying, where the feathers are going to get abraded pretty rapidly. Um, and so I would imagine a male would not have the chance to breed with a female. Um, she would not accept him because the females really are, we think, honed in on the males with a full bright red throat that are very active, very vocal. Those are the kinds of things they're looking for. And if they don't see that red throat, they're not going to have any interest whatsoever. Um, so no, we don't think that these birds are, are going to be breeding material, even if they were to survive. Okay, um, and a related question is, what preys on hummers? So what is it that's eating the hummingbirds? Hummingbirds are most susceptible to predation um, when they're in the nest, given the fact that um, they really are completely defenseless. The female will try to defend her nest from predators, um, but given her size, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, so the hope is that they are going to be camouflaged enough. And also young hummingbirds, when they're in the nest, are motionless while mom's away, so completely motionless. So they're trying not to be seen. But in the nest, if um, something like a, a blue jay or a squirrel catches sight of the nest, they may try to eat young or eggs. If you can see in this image that the nest is on a down sloping branch, the females tend to put the nest on a down sloping branch up towards the end of the branch where it's hard for predators to reach the young. But still, it certainly can happen. Even things like climbing snakes, black rat snakes or corn snakes might find a nest of hummingbirds. So the youngsters are very vulnerable to predation. The adults, not so much. Uh, our fast moving bird hawks, like sharp shinned hawks, have been known to chase hummingbirds. Um, don't know how successful they are at, at being able to actually catch one. Um, the, the thing that we see as being the main hazard for ruby throated, believe it or not, ironically, is spider webbing. Um, the same stuff they use in construction, constructing their nests. Big orb well weaving spiders at this time of year are pretty common on the landscape. And if a hummingbird flies or tries to fly through that webbing and gets stuck, that can be a real problem. Um, they aren't going to get eaten by a hummingbird, uh, by a, a spider up here. Certainly in the tropics that can happen, but around here, uh, all that's going to happen, they're going to end up getting exhausted. But we think this does happen to ruby throats a good bit. Um, there are other predators that have been known to catch hummingbirds, um, some very unusual ones too, in fact. Things like uh, bullfrogs, um, green herons. Certainly, if there's one sitting perched close to a climbing snake, again, something like a black rat snake, they have been known to catch hummingbirds. Um, unfortunately, there are cats that find it especially challenging to catch hummingbirds. Um, and that's one thing that is a concern. So if you know that there are free roaming cats around where you are, please keep your feeders high up um, and don't plant things 
very low such that you're going to set the birds up for a problem with a cat um, because cats do can and, and do catch hummingbirds as, unfortunately as well. Um, so there are some predators out there but it's mainly when the young are, are not yet able to, to fly and to get away from predators. All right we've got some more questions for you. Um, the next one uh, if there are more males at birth, what happens to the males that there are then more fe more female adults? Yeah, young males, two things. Uh, one is that for any creature that is the smaller body size wise, they are going to be living on the edge in, in terms of um, their physiology. And so they are more apt to have issues with survival and these young males being that they are smaller, even though the, the young males are not, believe it or not, as small as the adult males, the adult males' feathers on the wings grow in shorter, um, so it makes them functionally smaller as adults, but they're smaller, and so it's a little bit harder um, ergonomically to, to survive when you're that small. Um, also males, they, sometimes get a little bit too curious. They will do things that will get themselves in trouble. I can't tell you, you know, how many young males I've rescued from various and sundry uh, situations, um, like getting stuck in a garage. I'm sure a few people out there have had this experience of a hummingbird ending up in your garage in the summertime. It's up there flying around the ceiling. It can't get out. Um, What's happened usually in those cases is that the hummingbird has seen a little red knob on the emergency pull cord for the garage door opener. They come into the garage, they realize it's not a food item, they go leave and again they're going to fly up and into the ceiling and unless somebody rescues them they they can get exhausted and that that's not a good thing. Um, males, yeah, they tend to be more, more curious, they can get themselves into a fix and sometimes that can be can be lethal. Um, so yeah, the males have a lot kind of going against them from, from the beginning, um, unfortunately. All right, next question. Um, when you banned them, is the number entered on an international registry? Is there an organized effort to understand the travel patterns of hummingbirds? Yes, every bird ban that is issued, whether it's a hawk or a hummingbird ban, is reported to the National Repository where we get the bands from. And the data that's associated with that band is all entered. Um, it is public information, I will say, but the, the database itself is very cumbersome because it's so large. Um, that's not to say that if, if you find a bird band on any kind of a bird, uh, you can get information yourself by typing in the band number. Um, all you need to do is Google bird band and that's gonna pretty much, just like anything, take you to the location where you can report a, a band number. Um, and then if that band's been reported, if the information's been reported, you'll get a subset of that information instantly. Um, so our, our banding information does get entered into this repository on a regular basis. It is available there. Um, and the fact of the matter is in terms of questions that we have about birds, the scientists that are doing the work on species tend to be the ones that, the only ones that use this data. Um, but we are, yes, we are very interested in everything from um, distribution and ecology of these birds. Movements, migration is a big interest, understanding what they do and where they're going. Unfortunately, when it comes to North American hummingbirds, they head south of the border and they're mixed in with literally dozens of other species. Finding our North American hummingbirds in the wintertime is a real challenge. Right now, there's only one person that's doing any work at all on ruby-throated on the wintering grounds, and that's just in one small part of, of Costa Rica. Um, but yes, understanding where they go in the winter. One of the other things that is um, really disconcerting to those of us working with these birds is because there's so few scientists involved with research, we cannot say, even though we've, we banned, each of us bans hundreds every year, um, with ruby-throated, we cannot say to an order, order of magnitude how many ruby-throated there are in the population in the eastern U.S. right now. Um, I wish it were different, but it is a specialty, so it means that, um, you know, it's not something that every bird bander wants or can do. Um, 
but we are entering this data, we are continuing, that's why I'm trying, especially during migration, to ban as many as I can, because it puts more of them out there to potentially get recaptured, um, not just by, by me, but by, by others along the flyway. There are fortunately quite a few banders in the Southeast, there are quite a few hummingbird banders down in Texas, um, and they are the ones, the ones down in Texas are the ones that really confirm to us what is going on with ruby throated generally during migration? That being that in the spring, ruby throated as they head north, most of them cross the Gulf to get back to the US. But in the fall, most of them follow the Gulf coastline down into Mexico um, on their way southward. And that's something that we only learned fairly recently. So, um, so yes, we are trying to learn as much as we can from this. And the information is in a centralized location. Um, and that's that's obviously you know very very important. But um, but the Burbank Laboratory does look at the database. They do do things with the information like updating longevity records. As I mentioned, this, these females that are over nine years old, that is something that's very it's a very detailed documented um, situation for for ruby throated hummingbirds. Related to what you were just saying, uh, we have a question. Uh, do you know about how many there are and what percent decline is due to pollution and climate change? So have you gathered any data about that from banding? Well, unfortunately, as I said, because we don't know how large the population is in absolute numbers, we, we cannot empirically um, say that the population is growing, it's increasing or decreasing. The one thing that I can say is that here in North Carolina, there has been a trend in, in parts of the Piedmont and the mountains, and I think it's actually large portions of the Piedmont and the mountains, um, where numbers during the breeding season seem to be declining. Now, why they're declining, that again, it's probably pretty complicated, um, but we think that it has to do with um, habitat loss, in that uh, these birds need wild spaces, they need places um, where they, they can breed, where there aren't an abundance of predators. Um, they also need the food plants that are required for the insects that they eat. And as we go about removing vegetation or changing vegetation and planting in exotic species, um, this has a, an impact on the insect numbers, the insect populations, which are so critical for these little birds. Um, also, another thing that I strongly suspect is impacting their numbers is the fact that the insects are, we know, a lot of insects populations, and it's typically more the, the, the colorful, showy, larger things like bumblebees and butterflies and moths. Um, their populations are declining. I strongly suspect the same thing is happening with the insects, the tiny insects that these birds need. It's just that it's not something that's been very well studied. But we do know that with chemicals on the landscape, the use of chemicals, everything from companies that, that fog from mosquitoes um, to other types of er pesticides, um, as well as herbicides, and even to some degree, probably industrial chemicals, our atmosphere is, is unfortunately loaded with, with chemical residue. And you have declines in insectivorous birds now in the Amazon, well away from human habitation. And we think it's because of the amount of chemical that is just ending up in the atmosphere because there's so much of it. And it's raining down in places and impacting uh, wildlife far away from where people are. Um, it could be too that, that climate change is, is part of, of what's going on here as well. Um, again, it's when you get into ecological questions, it tends to be rather complicated. And I think with these birds, it's, it's rather complicated um, in addition to this fact that, that we don't have um, the statistics I wish we had to be able to, to back up some of our concerns. Um, Susan, we still have some other questions from our participants, but let's ask them a question. Would you like um, to pick one of the polls? Or I was thinking, since we were just talking about it, we could ask them about the number of hummingbirds they've been seeing. That's a good idea. All right. 
So how many hummingbirds have you been seeing this season? About the same number as last year, more than last summer, or fewer than last summer? Give you just a few more seconds to answer. Hmm. All right, it looks like uh, most people feel like it's about the same as last year, and some feel like they're seeing more than last summer. That's good news. Um, one thing is you, during the course of the summer, the spring, the summer, the early fall, it is a dynamic situation here in North Carolina in terms of numbers, even in the absence of anything bad going on. Um, when I started doing this work, it was very predictable with the early migrants coming through in April, there was a good bit of activity and then things would get very quiet and people would get concerned about where are the hummingbirds. And the fact of the matter is we don't expect to see a lot of hummingbird activity at flowers and at feeders in May and June because the males are away from feeders defending their primo hummingbird habitat patch uh, where they're expecting or hoping to attract females, whereas the females are very busy with nesting activities. And until the young have gotten a little larger and the females are needing more food in say uh, mid to late June, even early June, then you know then we tend we would tend to see them more often around. Um, and then it's like by about the second week of July somebody's flipped a switch and all of a sudden there are hummingbirds everywhere. And that's just from typically the young hummingbirds now being abundant on the landscape in addition to the adults. And so we tend to see this, this increase uh, in July, certainly by the end of July, everybody's noticing it, hopefully everybody's noticing it, and that continues into August. Um, and so, uh, you know, looking, looking at the big picture, we just, uh, it, it can be hard to know. And for me, I don't completely judge the, um, the success of a hummingbird season in terms of numbers uh, until the season is completely over, until sometime in October. Um, and then I sit back and look at the data that I've gathered and, and try to get a, you know, kind of an assessment of where we are. What's been concerning to me over the last six years is the fact that I have not been seeing very many young hummingbirds early in the season. Um, um, my concern is that the females during that time when they would be raising that first brood are having problems finding enough food for themselves and their young such that their success is very limited early in the year. And it's not until they try for that second brood um, that we then start seeing young hummingbirds. Now, this is not everywhere in North Carolina. I think the coastal plain things there are, are going really well for these birds. I'm glad to hear from people that I know in Hyde County and Bladen County and Pender County that are in the, in the coastal plain that are seeing lots and lots of hummingbirds there. But I will say that uh, in, in the work that I've done, banding work that I've done around the state during the breeding season and places that I have been going year after year, uh, I've seen this trend of fewer young hummingbirds uh, early in the season, it, it, it's, it's very disconcerting. Um, this year, I had people that, for the first time, quite a number of people early in the season, and quite frankly, even until just after the 4th of July, were telling me they had virtually seen no hummingbirds or had not seen any hummingbirds. And that was, that was definitely uh, very, very disconcerting. And my, my own experience in my own yard has has been along those same lines where uh, until migration started here, I think uh, we did not see very many birds this summer, and uh, it's very it's very disconcerting. I wish wish uh, wish things were were better. I'd also you know at first the first few years when I was looking at this and becoming concerned, 
thinking, well, this is probably a cycle. Um, you know, it's going to it's going to turn around, and um, I'm not sure that it's turning around. The other thing is that you can look at hummingbird reproductive success and and see a correlation with weather patterns. Um, and this is not just true for ruby throated but for other open nest, open cup nesting birds where they are impacted by cool, wet spring, uh, spring weather. And that makes it hard for them to pull off young when they have to protect those young, but they also have to be out feeding at the same time. Um, it, it leads to nesting failures. Um, but this spring, we had a little bit of that. But quite frankly, for the four or five years previous, we've not had those conditions that would lead me to think that it's a weather-related phenomenon. Um, I don't know, maybe next year, hopefully, maybe next year it'll turn around. It'll be a very different picture and there'll be more and more people that are seeing more hummingbirds. Um, and I will be catching young hummingbirds at the end of June like I used to very commonly and I haven't done for, for a while now. So Susan, we've got several questions about hummingbird feeders. I thought it'd be great to start that out by asking them your question about hummingbird feeders. So sure. I'm gonna launch our poll question about that. So when should you take your hummingbird feeder down? Today, around Labor Day, Halloween, or never? What do you think? Give you about 10 more seconds to answer. All right, most people think around Halloween. What's the right answer, Susan? Okay, around Halloween, this is a little bit of a trick question. Around Halloween is not a bad answer at all. Um, because around Halloween, most of our migrants, most of our migrant ruby throats have passed through and are well to our south. Um, so by Halloween, most folks have probably been a week or more from seeing their last hummingbird. And that's what I, I generally say to folks if, you know, you're, you want to wait until you've not seen a hummingbird for at least 10 days to two weeks. Because sometimes we'll have these stray stray migrants that are coming from, I don't know, somewhere up in Canada probably, that don't make it through until a lot later. Um, so that's, you know, for most people, that's, that would be very appropriate. However, here in North Carolina, we have hummingbirds in the wintertime that show up. And so really, uh, what I will tell people, if they really are interested in hummingbirds, leave a feeder up year round. Um, because you never know, you may be one of these people that attracts a winter hummingbird. They are out there. Um, Barbara Driscoll knows this very well because she, she uh, and her husband have been successful at attracting uh, winter hummingbirds more than once. And the winter hummingbird that we tend to see here in North Carolina more than any other is the rufous hummingbird. And the picture that's on the screen now is a, an adult male rufous. Um, they are Western species, most of which migrate down generally to the same area where the ruby-throateds go. But we now know, and we've known this for a while, that there's a part, part of the population that comes from the West Coast across the U.S. and spends the winter in the Southeast. Rufus hummingbirds are very cold hardy. They actually breed along the West Coast and into Southwestern Canada and Southeastern Alaska. So these are very, very tough little hummingbirds. Our winter weather is probably not much different than their summertime weather on a lot of days. Um, so having them here through the wintertime um, is, is not that much of a stretch when you really think about it. Um, and I think the fat, fact is that they've been here a long time. Even before people had feeders out or forgot to take their feeders down and they would find a feeder, uh, we have located, documented, Rufus hummingbirds away from feeders multiple times here in North Carolina. So they're not here because of people's feeders or people's flowers. They'll certainly take advantage of that if they tend to find, if they find a feeder or flowers. 
Um, but we know they are here in the winter time. They can survive in the winter time, no problem. We have had multiple individual Rufus that have come back winter after winter after winter their whole life. Uh, we have had now three different Rufus hummingbirds that have been in North Carolina for seven consecutive winters. Um, so if you leave a feeder up, you might attract a Rufus hummingbird. You might attract something else. We have literally had 11 species of hummingbirds in addition to ruby-throated documented in North Carolina. And those are Western species that have turned up. And in a number of cases, it's been more than just one individual, like Anna's hummingbird, very famously found on the West Coast. And here in North Carolina, we have had four different Anna's hummingbirds over the years. We even had an Anna's in New Bern that spent two different winters at the same feeder. Um, and other species of Western species of hummingbird as well have turned up here and they've turned up not in the summer, but in the winter and they've found feeders or flowers and have taken advantage of that. Um, and it's been, it's been a wonderful surprise. And those birds, they've been well equipped to survive. Uh, it's not been an accident. Um, and so leaving a feeder up year round, you might get lucky and, and attract one of these winter birds. Winter rufous hummingbirds are not as rare as we used to think. And we only realized that rufous were here in the winter about 25 to 30 years ago. Um, so it's not been that long that even bird watchers have been aware that they are here. Um, but yes, they are here. And if you leave a feeder up, you might very well attract one. And sometimes these little guys and gals don't show up until we have some real cold weather. So not just the first frost, but the first freeze. I had my, uh, one of the Rufus hummingbirds that overwintered in my yard literally showed up on Thanksgiving. We had had a freeze that night and it found the feeder and was with me for the rest of the winter. Um, so sometimes there are lulls that people have between the ruby throat leaving and then a Rufus or something else showing up later. Um, that being said, as you can see by this little guy who's already on site in Virginia, I don't know if he'll stay or not, but they can overlap with ruby throats, um, which makes it kind of interesting in, in August and September um, when, when something odd shows up, it oftentimes doesn't really get recognized until later on in the, in the fall when it's the only one left. And then somebody who doesn't know about it, of course, starts to worry that they have a hummingbird that hasn't migrated. And that's why I'll get panicky phone calls or panicky emails from people wondering what to do. But they're very, very cold tolerant. And what's interesting, and Barbara can chime in on this, these winter hummingbirds, they don't camp out at your feeder. Um, they'll be there in the morning for breakfast, but they'll take off and be gone for hours at a time looking for bugs and feeding on bugs. Um, it's only if it's, you know, particularly wet and cold that they may kind of linger near the feeder and feed, you know, every 30 minutes, kind of like a ruby throat would do in the summer. Um, but they are not at all dependent on the feeder. Uh, they are very good at, at finding insects. And if you have a winter hummingbird find you, it means that the habitat around you is good hab habitat for hummingbirds and is holding insects um, or else the bird wouldn't be there because they certainly need that protein, as I said, uh, way more than they need sugar, water, or, or flowers. So Susan, I'm just gonna chime in and say this is one reason why it's really important to have native plants and yes. to keep your large native trees because those really have a lot of insects um, that are advantage to not only hummingbirds, but the other birds in your yard. Definitely, definitely. Um, having the shelter, having the insects there, really, really critical um, year round and certainly makes a difference for these wintering hummingbirds. The places where, literally hundreds of places that I've documented winter hummingbirds now, um, all of them tend to have Thicker vegetation, it's usually native vegetation. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's things like Leland cypress, or um, but oftentimes it's it's older trees, older shrubs, providing that nice thick cover and lots and lots of insects. Even in the coldest weather, there is a microclimate there that's going to support the insects that uh, these little hummingbirds need. So most definitely, native vegetation. If they're they're Two things you can do for hummingbirds. 
One is use as little chemical as you possibly can in your yard, but even more importantly, encourage or restore native vegetation. So it supports what the insects need, the insects that are so critical to these little birds, because it really is very critical for them. On that note, Susan, how about we ask them the poll question about their favorite native plant for hummingbirds? Great. So which is your favorite native plant for hummingbirds? Cardinal flower, fire pink, red columbine, woodland pink root, bee balm, or cross sign? And Lauren, I think you have a slide to share with the images of those. I do. All right, our favorite, it looks like, is cardinal flower, and then bee balm, and red columbine. So I've got a slide here for you. If it'll play nice, there we go. Um, of those six plants, Susan, which is your favorite hummingbird well, plant? It's hard to say because these different, these different plants flower at diff different times of the year, which is what makes all of them quite good. Um, when you go from something like cross vine, which is blooming abundantly as the birds arrive in the spring and you move on, also columbine will be. And um, uh, I, really, I really like columbine. It, it is um, a beautiful little plant. I like the leaves even when it's not blooming later in the, in the summertime. Um, but then you get a little bit later in the season and the cardinal flower comes up and we also have trumpet creeper vine that's blooming. Um, that's wonderful as well. Um, the, the color of the cardinal flower, if I had to choose of any of these, I think the cardinal flower would be my favorite as well because it, that deep red is just, is just so beautiful. And each one of those stalks has blooms on it for a long, long time. All right, I've got a few more questions here for you, Susan. Um, Great. See if I can. Uh, oh, is there a deer resistant flower that provides nectar? Oh, yeah. Um, actually, um, this is when you get, you get into more, um, unfortunately, non native hummingbird plants, things that are not native up here, but that are native where the hummingbirds go in the wintertime, down in, in the tropics, down in, the cent in Central and South America, things like salvias or sages. Um, most of them are not going to be invasive at all. So um, including those in your hummingbird plantings is not a bad idea. Here I have a real problem with rabbits more so than with deer. And um, so it's something that I'm, I'm acutely aware of trying to, to plant for my hummingbirds um, and not get it gobbled down by the, by the rabbits. But um, some of these, these plants that are, that are from the tropics like, um, like the salvias, the sages, which are such a fantastic group of, of flowers, um, they are going to have hair and or aromatic oils in the leaves that deer and rabbits really do not like. Um, but in terms of some of our, our native plants, that's where, you know, it gets tricky. I think with our native plants, you, they, they, they're very abundant. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that they, they do, they've historically done well in the landscape. They're abundant. And also, you know, back in the days when, when, when we weren't around there, there weren't as many deer or as many rabbits either to be a problem, but, um, there are the, some of the, the natives that are, are going to, to do well. Um, although, you know, with deer, it's hard to, to say absolutely because you get a, a hungry deer will eat just about anything. And um, so that can be, that can be pretty tricky. Um, I don't, 
I've not had ever had issues with them eating something like cardinal flour, but maybe other people have. Um, they certainly do graze things like, like um, columbine. Um, just trying to think. Some of the vine, that's what makes some of the vines really good because you, they're going to grow up and away from where the deer are, whether it is the cross vine, whether it's jessamine, whether it's trumpet creeper, um, whether it's the native wisteria. We do have a native wisteria and the hummingbirds like that. Um, growing, growing vines is going to get those plants up and away from where the deer can graze easily. Um, that might be a thought. Um, and we do have shrubs and trees that hummingbirds use the, the blooms from during the spring and early summer. Everything from our native azalea uh, to things like sourwood and even tulip poplar to some degree, hummingbirds will, will nectar on. And um, so that's, that's a way too to, you know, there are shrubs and trees that you can introduce into the landscape that hopefully, you know, the birds will be able to nectar on and the deer won't be able to, to nibble away. Susan, I'll just add coral honeysuckle is also a really good um, yes. plant, plant for hummingbirds. Yes, coral honeysuckle. Um, no, no, no on the Japanese honeysuckle as much as they like it. We all know that stuff is so invasive. Um, I'm dealing with it here in, in the yard still. I've been ripping at it for quite a while still plenty unfortunately coming up here and there uh, but coral honeysuckle is wonderful and you can get the actual you know the, the native strains um, but they have also um, created new new forms that are all yellow um, but definitely uh, coral honeysuckle is one that I've always had uh, in my yard for, for hummingbirds it grows well it grows vigorously um, needs very little care, and the birds love it. All right, we've got some other questions. Um, all right. Um, do, do, do. do you recommend the humbug feeders to provide insects? Okay. This is a, a very a new item out there. Um, hummingbirds are big business, and so people are always looking to create a better feeder or some other gizmo or gadget that people will, will buy to use um, in their yard. The one thing I will say about feeders of any kind for birds or wildlife, the industry is not regulated. And so people can and do sell things that may not live up to expectation, may not do what they say they're supposed to do. And in some cases, and this is true of hummingbird feeders, can be dangerous. Now, what I will say about the bug feeders, they are not a bad idea at all. Um, some hummingbirds, some hummingbirds seem to take notice when you're growing fruit flies, which is essentially what these feeders are doing. Um, but quite honestly, you can do the same thing with a pie plate. It just might not look as great. Um, and I will say that I have always had hummingbirds, I've noticed at least once a year, hummingbirds flying around my compost pile, just taking advantage of the insects from the fruit and vegetable peelings that are there. Um, the feeder itself, I don't think it's a bad idea at all to give it a try um, and see if your hummingbirds use it, but just be aware that there, there are other ways to do that that don't cost you anything um, that you might be able to consider as well. And along those lines, um, is it okay to make sugar water at home or should they buy the commercial formula? What's your recommendation? M I heartily heartily endorse making your own. Um, again, hummingbird feeding is big business. And so there have been so many feeders on the landscape. And then for the last, oh good, goodness, probably 20 years now, we've had nectar, nectar mixes as well on shelves. And in the case of those mixes, whether it's a dry mix or something liquid, um, it's mainly sugar to begin with. 
namely sugar. So you're paying for a small box with a fancy label and you're paying a premium basically for sugar. Um, but the downside here is that most of the mixes you're going to buy are going to have preservatives and, and additives in them that are of questionable value and questionable safety. Um, so there are some mixes out there that are basically just 100% sugar, but again, you're paying a premium for that. Uh, really, all you need to do is use table sugar and water uh, and make your own. You can refrigerate sugar water solution, the, a four to one mix, which is what I advocate, four parts water, one part sugar. You can refrigerate that easily for two weeks. Uh, I know people that will freeze small containers of it, make up a big batch and freeze small containers that that way sugar water when it's frozen like that will last you months. Um, it's the cheapest and it's the safest way to feed your birds. Um, these mixes are, are really not something that I am at all comfortable with. And I will also mention, and some of you may have seen this because it's, it's a little bit new this year, um, there's been a product on the landscape for a few years now called Nectar Defender. And that Nectar Defender is now being sold in combination with food mixes. It's not just being sold by itself. And the Nectar Defender, in my opinion, and I'm not the only one that feels this way, Nectar Defender is very questionable. It is a product that was created to be added to hummingbird food as a preservative. It's a it got a copper-based compound in it. Um, but we have no way of knowing whether this stuff is safe at all. Um, absolutely no way. The, the way the, that the whole project was developed was, was, it was not done very well at all, in my opinion. Um, and it is something that I find very questionable. And I, I, I just, you know, I, I wish it wasn't out there on the landscape, but I do end up talking about it quite a bit. So people are aware that the claims that they make about Nectar Defender, um, quite honestly, are not proven or not necessarily true. Uh, so sugar and water, that's the easiest, best, safest way to go if you're going to have a feeder. Um, and also, as I already mentioned, you're going to have a feeder when it's warm, like above 80 degrees, and we have this humidity in the summertime, and your feeder especially is in direct sunlight, where things are going to grow in the sugar water. You do need to clean your feeders uh, every three days, uh, and that means using hot water. You don't want to use soap if you're cleaning plastic parts of the feeder. If you're just cleaning some glass, that's okay. But using soap for the base of your feeder or the reservoir, if it happens to be all plastic, is a problem because soaps adhere very tightly to plastic and the birds will be able to, to taste any residue that's there. Uh, so that's why I always advocate just using hot water. You can use a little vinegar, that's probably okay. And you can also use a 10% leach solution. That is safe. You want to rinse very well, but the beauty of bleach is that should there be a teeny bit of residue there when you refill the sugar water, the bleach is gonna be rendered inert by the sugar water. Um, so yes, keep that in mind, no soap, just use hot water. And honestly, if you're washing your feeders out every three days with hot water, you're probably not going to have too much trouble with mildew or mold or anything else growing in the feeder. That in and of itself, you should stay, be able to stay ahead of it such that your feeders are easier to clean. Great. Thank you, Susan. That was great information about feeders. Um, got just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, are there reasons or hypotheses why there's only one species of hummingbird in the Eastern United States, but multiple species in the West? I wish we could answer that question. Um, I think one, one thing that's very evident, and this is not a surprise to anyone, is that ruby-throateds are very aggressive hummingbirds for their body size. Um, and so they, will, uh, they will definitely drive away other species. Um, I've seen this a good bit in the work that I've done um, with the wintering birds. Um, in places where people have ruby-throated in the wintertime, um, and this is a whole another subject for another day, but 
here in North Carolina, we have wintering ruby throated along the coast. And some of those people have ended up with Rufus hummingbirds as well. And oh my gosh, um, the, the fighting that goes on is something else. Um, and also we've had situations where Western species of hummingbirds have shown up in somebody's yard in the summertime. This is very, very rare, but it happens. And generally those Western species, those Western individuals don't stay long because they get chased away by the ruby-throated. And ruby-throateds, I didn't have a chance to say this earlier, but ruby-throateds are aggressive. It doesn't matter if it's a male or a female, a young bird or an adult, uh, they are just downright nasty. Um, and the females, because they're larger, if they get into a fight, uh, they can win by virtue of their size. And I see this in the spring a lot with females and adult males feeding around feeders. And the females are very focused on what they need to do. So they are really needing to eat, 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 eat. And um, so they, they are very aggressive. And so it's, it's possible that maybe earlier in history when when during the springtime there might have been other species of hummingbirds around, um, the ruby-throateds have pretty much, would have, would have probably um, driven them away. Um, but we don't know that, we really don't know that for a fact as to, as to why, yes, we see five or six or seven different species of hummingbirds in the Western US, whereas here we see fewer. It may have to do with the fact that the Eastern US is further east, significantly further east from that corridor down into Central America, whereas the Western states are essentially due north. So that the birds have to, the ruby throats have to travel a ways. Um, and it may have something to do with that, the distance, the, the migratory path that they take um, that's unique to, to ruby throated. And um, it's something that maybe evolved more recently uh, than, than these uh, the Western species and, and their their history on the landscape. All right, interesting. Um, we've got a couple questions about how weather affects hummingbirds. Um, how does rain affect them when they're flying? And what about temperature sensitivity? Yeah, um, hummingbirds and, and weather, obviously they've been, can, been dealing with weather you know, for forever. Um, they do not fly in heavy rain because their plumage, just like all birds, their plumage would get saturated. So they'll, they'll hole up someplace during a heavy storm or uh, during a hurricane, that kind of thing, or even heavy snow. Um, they would be looking to get away from the precipitation. Um, but if it's light rain, it's not so much of a problem. Um, they will continue to feed. Insects will even be active when there's just light rain. Um, but yeah, they, they have to shelter in order to keep from getting completely waterlogged, just like our other birds. So they'll find a protected spot and get out of heavy rain for sure, regardless of whether it's warm weather or, or cold weather. Um, they can contend with wind quite easily. Um, they are, because of their ability, their flight ability, uh, they can feed from feeders that are swinging in the wind with, with ease. Um, so they're not, not as, as affected by wind as you might, as you might think. Um, but I will say during migration, if the weather is bad, in other words, if there's approaching front bad storms or hurricanes, something like that, um, they are not going to continue to fly. They are going to stay where they are. They can not only, I'm sure, sense changes in barometric pressure, but also they're not going to try to, to fly into a headwind and, and fly into a storm, they are, instincts are gonna tell them to stay put until the weather passes. And in terms of cold, um, they use this, as I said, the nighttime uh, hibernation called torpor. And um, so they'll conserve energy that way. Um, and they do that, certainly I've seen it, I've seen birds go into torpor on a feeder in the fall during migration, ruby throats. Um, so they'll use torpor at night to, to really ramp down the respiratory rate, their heart rate in order to conserve energy when it's colder. Um, but they are no, nowhere near as, as cold tolerant as species like rufous hummingbirds or calliopes, the, the tiny hummingbird we find at elevation out west. Um, they are just, they are just not that cold tolerant. Um, 
So probably one of the main factors that drives the fact that they, that they migrate a lot further south um, for the, the winter months. All right, and we had um, a follow-up question just wanting clarification on making your own um, sugar water for feeders, if they need to bring that water all the way up to a boil when they're making the food. It's not critical. However, I would say if you're on city water where there are additives in the water, um, probably a good idea. That's, that's my own feeling on the matter. Um, when you're heating the water, really the heating is a lot facilitating mixing the sugar more than anything. It's, it's not really sterilizing. Um, the feeder, even if you have a clean feeder, it's not going to be very sterile per se. Um, so boiling it for a certain amount of time, that kind of thing is probably not critical, but if you, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, but again, if you've got additives, if you know there are additives in, in your city water, then, then you, you might want to be making sure that you, that you heat it. If you're on well water, not a big deal. I had to use rainwater after Hurricane Fran when I was in Raleigh and still had lots of hummingbirds. Uh, and it just meant that my arm got sore from, from mixing, mixing, mixing to get the sugar to, develop, to dissolve, so. All right, great. And we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, Joanna is posting in the chat for us uh, your website that's got more information about feeders as well as the other resources mm -hmm. we'll be sending out. Um, do you have any last thoughts for us in our last few minutes? Well, I guess going back to my very last slide and that being that um, I hope at least a few people leave their feeders up this winter. And if anybody does attract a hummingbird after Halloween or have a hummingbird still there after Halloween, please let me know because um, I would love, love to hear from you. would love to help you figure out what kind of hummingbird you have. And even better yet, come by to maybe pay a visit and, and band your hummingbird. Um, every year there are winter hummingbirds in the Triangle area, every year. Some years more than others. And I'm hoping this year is one of those more than others kind of winters. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you can leave a feeder up, um, I would, would really heartily recommend that and I would hope to hear from you if you get fortunate enough to attract a rufus or, or something else. Um, that would be fantastic. And um, yes, that's probably the best note to leave it on. And certainly would love to hear from people uh, if they have other questions or comments or, or issues down the line, just feel free to send me an email. Um, I don't have any problem with that. Hey, Susan, I just wanted to add, thank you so much, great talk. Uh, if people want to support your work, they can also send um, money to the Friends of the Museum at Hummingbird Fund? Yes, yes. Um, I receive checks there to the nonprofit to help support this work, and I'm at a point now where I'm actually replacing equipment that I've had for actually 20 years. I've been doing this for over 20 years, so I'm replacing equipment right now. And um, so that's, it's been a real help for, for people uh, from, to, get, to get donations from people. I also have an Adopt a Hummingbird program, uh, which is something we would have talked more about had I been doing this with everybody in person and, and folks have had a chance, would have had a chance to, to let a hummingbird go and adopt a hummingbird today. Um, we do that for a $20 donation. And I still do that during the course of the year from folks who have, you know, birthdays or anniversaries or something that they want to celebrate with a living gift. And so I'm adopting hummingbirds all year long, not just in the summertime. Um, and there'll be, there's information about that right there with my contact and, um, and all of that, that that you will be getting after, after this talk. So if you'd like to adopt a hummingbird, it's never too late to do that. But I definitely do appreciate contributions to, to the nonprofit fund at the museum. Right. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Barbara. And thank you, everybody who's joined us today virtually. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to meet in person this time, but it was still a great talk, and I'm so glad you were able to catch a few hummingbirds for us to see. We will be sending it in person, but you know, we try. Still pretty cool to see. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email with some resources for people, as well as a short survey about this program. We really would appreciate it if you could take a moment to fill that out. Um, your feedback really matters to us and we'll get the recording to you as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.